Good morning and good afternoon to all of you for joining our live webinar today, SSM Electrophysiology as a Tool for Uncovering Transporter Function. Today's webinar marks the third of five upcoming talks that will make up part of our 2021 Research Insights Transporter Webinar Series. My name is Jason Villagomez, Marketing Manager at Onion Technologies, and will be your moderator for today's event. But before we get started, my colleague, Dr. Maria Barthmas, Senior Scientist and Product Manager of the Surfer team would like to say a few words. Thank you, Jason. Um, also from my side, a very warm welcome to everybody joining us today. And in particular, um, also a special welcome to those returning. Um, as Jason announced, this is a webinar series. So we are hosting five sessions um, over the year. This today is the third session. And if you're interested, or if you missed the first and second session, you can still watch them on demand on our web page. Um, we're very happy that so many uh, scientists share their work in our webinar. And so um, I want to start with a big thank you to all the speakers. Um, in particular today, um, Lars and Olga, thanks a lot for presenting here. It's really an honor. Um, but before we start, I would just like to draw your attention for a second to our um, instrumentation grant. So there are two weeks left um, for applications. So what you will get is um, a six months um, free instrument, consumables, and our scientific support for your uh, scientific project. So we did host this um, grant for, for some time now, and we had some uh, great winners of the grant, which also continued with, with really exciting projects. So if you're interested, um, you have two weeks left, and um, actually the, the winners of the grant will be announced within this month. So um, yeah, you can apply um, by requesting a hard copy and you also find the, the details on our webpage. You can fill a form there. It's, it's not much work. Um, just let us know if you're interested. Um, we will also post a link directly to the, to the webpage um, in a minute. With that, um, thanks everybody for attending. Thanks for presenting. And um, I hand back over to Jason. Thanks, Maria, for the exciting updates uh, to look forward to and uh, for any additional uh, grant applications that we're to receive. So joining us today as presenters, uh, Olga Budker, Professor of Physiology and Biophysics, Biocornell Medical College, and Lars Jukins, Professor of Molecular Biophysics, Faculty of Biological Science at the University of Leeds. Olga's presentation is entitled Cryo-EM Structures of Human Neuro Neuro no glutamate transporters. Lars will then proceed with his presentation entitled SSM-based electrophysiological characterization of a metal transporter. I just want to go over a little bit of due diligence. Um, so upon completion of the presentation, we're going to hold the live Q&A session with the presenters and as such welcome you to ask questions throughout the course of the presentations. You can log a question in the chat window found on the right hand side of your screen. If you experience any difficulties at any point in time, please feel free to write to us directly. Additionally, uh, today's on-demand copy will be made available inclusive of, of a transcribed copy of the Q&A. I look forward to any questions that are in, inbound throughout the course of the talk. Uh, I now hand over to Olga for the start of the presentation. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let me share the screen. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here today, and uh, I am really looking forward to this talk. It's a new talk with a pandemic. I haven't had a chance to present this work yet, so it's kind of exciting, but it might be a little bit rough around the edges, I suspect. So this work is work primarily of Biao, um, uh, a postdoc in the lab, and he had help from Eva in the lab and from um, Doreen and Jihen in uh, Janelia uh, Farm, Cryo Yem Center. So what we wanted to do here is to look at the structures of uh, glutamate transporters from humans 
and particularly on E3. So um, as many of you probably know, these transporters are integral players in glutamate-mediated neural transmission. So here the idea is that you have synaptic vesicles that are fusing with a membrane uh, during the neurotransmission. And um, the neurotransmitter is released in the synaptic cleft that interacts with a bunch of receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. Um, and that leads to the propagation of the electric signaling um, to the postsynaptic neuron. So glutamate following that um, event needs to be cleared out. And this is done by dedicated transporters that reside um, in um, various membranes around the synapse. And these transporters also called excitatory amino acid transporters, they come in uh, five flavors. A um, um, couple of them um, reside in glial cells that basically wrap around the synapses. These are um, um, number two and number one. Number two being the, um, sorry, I can't see it myself here on the edge, uh, is the workhorse uh, in the brain. And there are also a few that are uh, located to the neurons. A couple of them, uh, four and five, are specific to uh, very special areas in the brain. And E3 is a very uh, widely distributed in the brain, as well as in other tissues, particularly in um, uh, intestinal lining and in kidney. And this transporter also can pick up cysteine, which is unique to this transporter and very important for neuronal health. So some of the susceptibility to uh, uh, oxidative stress is sometimes in, in some cases linked to the dysfunction of these transporters. So uh, the glutamate transporters were cloned um, were cloned in the mid 1990s by a number of labs, uh, and then started in great detail. Particularly, I want to point out Baruch Kanner and Susan Amara's work that was uh, truly um, um, setting up the stage for uh, for this field of research. And uh, there's also beautiful uh, functional work that was done about the same time. In particular, I want to point out the work by Mike Kavana on a, a functional. Uh, characterization of EADS, particularly E3 in this particular paper, where uh, he and his colleagues showed that uh, these transporters transport one molecule of glutamate together with three sodium ions and one proton and counter transport one potassium ion. And they were able to determine uh, kinetic parameters for each of these uh, uh, components. What those also shown about the same time uh, is that these transporters are uh, not only maintain this ionic coupled currents, and you can see that there's two positive charges that are going in for every transport cycle, but they also mediate uh, thermodynamically uncoupled chloride flux. That flux is uh, triggered by glutamate binding, but doesn't require the completion of the cycle, transport cycle. Um, so there are these two uh, electric currents and um, um, that are present in these transporters to various extents, depending on the subtype. So the transporters kinetically are quite different with E3 being the fastest uh, of um, um, glutamate transporters in humans. And perhaps because of that, it was a very um, popular model system to study and is still popular uh, system to study by electrophysiology. And in fact, I want to say that this is in my understanding as a poster child for the um, uh, surfer measurements, because this is, this is from the application note where um, the transporters were expressed in cells and then vesicles were made from the cell membranes and then um, attached to the solid surface. And, uh, and you can measure the capacitance currents uh, resulting from the uh, um, transport currents through the transporter. And you can see here, for example, beautiful dose responses for aspartate and glutamate and for cysteine, which as I say, is unique to E3, a unique substrate for this transporter. So um, much of what we know uh, already about the mechanism and structures of these transporters comes from the work on uh, archaeal homologs on GLTPH and uh, closely related GLTTK. These transporters have similar uh, functional properties in that they transport acetic amino acid aspartate with three sodium ions, but they don't couple to potassium and protons like to the mammalian transporters. They also seem to have the chloride plaques. So there's been many, many uh, structural studies that kind of elucidated uh, the overall transport cycle of these transporters. This is a movie that was made by Zhao Yu Wang uh, for one of our papers, but there's many studies from many labs, um, and I'll point this out in a second, uh, that contribute to the general vision of how these transporters are working. Uh, 
They are thought to be trimers, and here we're looking at them from the extracellular side, made up of uh, each protomer made up of two domains of the scaffold domain and transport domain. Scaffold domains form a trimer, and uh, transport domains contain the substrate and ion binding sites, and they are translocating the substrate and ions across the membrane by the so called elevator mechanism independently in each protomer. It's illustrated here. First, the two sodium ions bind, and this gate. Um, region called HP2 opens, then the rest of the cargo binds, the gate closes, and once the gate closes, the, the whole domain can translocate into the inward position and then release the cargo by, um, by swinging out. So not the, in this case, not a gating element, but the whole domain swings out, opening up the substrate binding site. And then once the cargo is released, the, uh, the transporter can close and return to the outward facing state. So this uh, leads to this kind of generalized scheme, and as I say, this is based uh, on work from our laboratory, but also from Dirk Slotboom, Irene Ryan, and Falke's labs. Uh, so collectively, uh, there is this kind of generalized scheme where the transporter starts in the outward facing state, first bind two sodium ions, then binds another uh, ion and a substrate, translocates, releases, and then comes back. The question that I want to point out here is how are these processes driven by ionic gradients? And in particular, in this case, how are they driven by sodium gradient? And the kind of consensus maybe that um, um, that been arrived to is that there's basically one thing that you have to achieve to have the coupling. You cannot transport sodium without aspartate, and you cannot transport aspartate without sodium. If you can achieve that, then you can take advantage of the thermodynamic energy stored in this ionic gradient to drive uptake of substrate against concentration gradient. So this is achieved in two ways. On one hand, once you, if the transporter binds sodium, the gate opens and this open conformation presumably prevents the direct translocation of the domain across the membrane and prevents sodium transport. On the other hand, aspartate alone is unable to bind to the apod transporter unless sodium ions have already pre-bound and set the structure. And overall, there is a strong cooperativity between binding of the substrate and sodium ions, so that neither of them bind well alone, but they bind very well together. And this was shown in this kind of experiment where the KD for aspartate was measured as a function of sodium concentration. And you can see it here plotted um, on a log-log scale. You can see how drastically by orders of magnitude the affinity increases as we increase the concentration of sodium ion. And the slope of this uh, line here is about almost approaching three, which is the num total number of sodium ions that are coupled in the system. So uh, structurally, this kind of coupling comes from a significant restructuring that happens around the substrate binding site when sodium ions are, um, um, are binding. And uh, one particular restructuring that we thought uh, struck us very much when we looked at these structures was the behavior of this methionine, a highly conserved methionine that in a sodium bound state is swung into the binding site and actually makes interactions with a substrate. But in the absence of sodium, in the apo state, it swings out of the substrate, and you can see that uh, the gating element, HP2 here, is collapsed on the binding site. There's also movement of this arginine that was pointed out by Dirk in particular, that is uh, uh, swung out um, in a sodium bound state, but it swings into the binding site and kind of occupies the substrate site uh, in the apo state. So we at the time proposed that this methionine will be the, the coupling arm that uh, communicates sodium binding to the uh, substrate binding uh, region. And indeed, if you mutate that methionine, um, you, you, you dramatically uh, decrease the coupling between the substrate and sodium binding. But recently, actually, Dirk and um, Jose Feraldo Gomez showed that if you mutate methionine, you still maintain the same stoichiometry of three sodium ions per substrate, suggesting that the, uh, the coupling mechanism might be different. Nevertheless, this movement of methionine is kind of the hallmark of, um, of the um, 
conformational changes that are triggered by sodium in these transporters. So we wanted to see which of these features and to what extent are recapitulated in the human transporters. So we set out on this uh, project by optimizing the construct of human EAT3 and that there was not much optimization really. The only thing we did was to mutate out two glycosylation sites and that resulted in a fairly well-behaved protein. You can see it eluding in a fairly homogeneous peak on the sizing column here in blue. And uh, that's a construct that we proceeded to characterize. It showed similar activity to the wild type when expressed in all sites in uh, electrophysiological experiments. You can see similar IV curves and similar dose responses with uh, similar um, EC50 values for, um, for aspartate. Then we also expressed this protein on a large scale, purified it, reconstituted it into the liposomes that were composed of PC, PE, and cholesterol mixture, and then used this liposome in liposomes in a so, uh, solid supported um, um, membrane capacitance measurements. So what uh, what happens here? The liposomes are attached to the surface, and we are measuring charging of the liposomes as the uh, transporters in the liposomes are transporting their substrates. You can see that if you look at this uh, uh, system and you perfuse now on, onto the liposomes, you perfuse a solution that contains aspartate but doesn't contain sodium or contains sodium but doesn't contain aspartate, we see no electric response. But if we perfuse aspartate and sodium together, we have a, a robust uh, capacitance current that we can measure that current can be inhibited by uh, a well-established transporter blocker, TFB-TBOA, uh, that is shown here. It's basically an aspartate with a bulky group here. You can see that without the inhibitor, we have a robust response. And as we increase the inhibitor concentration to three and 10 micromolar, we suppress the, uh, that response. And then we can wash off the inhibitor and recover the response to, um, um, to the substrate, showing that the inhibition is uh, reversible. Um, with this uh, assay in hand, we also looked at the dose response to uh, aspartate, and we obtain indeed increased peak currents uh, as we increase the aspartate concentration. But it was pointed out to us by the reviewer that the shape of these uh, peaks was kind of weird. It's they, they were too narrow and they had the significant negative overshoot. So it was a, a, a a suspicion that this may not be a, a multi turnover transport, but instead might be just a binding to the transporter. Um, and that might be the electric signature or form of, of binding. So um, uh, we were asked to test that. And we were thinking that it's also possible that because there is a chloride current is that we're seeing a mixture of the transport and chloride currents. And then that gives us this kind of very quickly decaying uh, capacitance uh, current peaks. So we repeated this experiments in the presence of non-permeant anion removing the chloride. And now we were able to obtain uh, a slowly decaying uh, currents that are much more um, compatible with the idea that we are looking at multiple turnover transport currents here. When we plotted this dose response, uh, uh, dose dependence, we saw that <clears throat> that um, EC50s were similar um, for the um, non-permeant and permeant um, anion. So this convinced us that we are looking at um, a transporter that is fairly functional. We can purify it, <clears throat> reconstitute and see its function. And now we put it on the grids and um, determine that structure. The first structure we determined was uh, in the presence of 200 millimolar sodium and one millimolar uh, aspartate. So it's highly saturating uh, conditions. And we were able to resolve uh, a trimer. It looks like a typical glutamate transporter. If you look at it from the side, you can see that the transport domains are sort of toward the cytoplasm. So it clearly is um, an inward facing state. So what we did next is to look at the, um, um, at the, do something that's called symmetry expansion. So in that exercise, you basically cut out with a mask one protomer, and then you cut out all the other protomers and overlay them on, uh, on that one protomer, and then sort out these kind of cut out particles into di potentially different conformations. So when we did that, we found that about 80% uh, 
of all protomers were in an inward facing state, which was expected because that's what we see in overall um, reconstructions, but about 20% were in an outward facing state. And I actually really like what Biao did after that because they did this, he did this beautiful exercise where he basically tracked back um, what were those trimers where these, these uh, protomers have come from, and he was able to sort out the trimers into all possible possibilities, into all three protomers in the outward facing state, all three protomers in the inward facing states, and various mixtures of the three, and he could measure or estimate the populations of each of these states. And it turns out that these populations were in perfect agreement with what you would expect from binomial distribution, considering the probability of the inward facing state of 80%. So it means that the uh, outward inward distribution of the protomers in the trimers is completely stochastic, which is consistent with what we've been thinking about these transporters all along. And it means that, that each protomer is moving independently in this transporter. So when we looked at the structure of the outward facing state of the transporter, we saw a classical glutamate transporter fold with substrate binding site looking the way it always looks. And um, uh, this is what the substrate looks like. The, it's underneath this gating element HP2, and it is coordinated by highly conserved arginine over here, which is a very typical uh, glutamate transporter arrangement. When we looked at the inward protomers, we saw something that was surprising to us, is that despite the fact that we have one millimolar substrate in the imaging conditions, the inward facing state that we visualized here uh, showed an open conformation of the binding site with no substrate bound in it, despite one millimolar binding. So that was really striking to us. Yet the way it was opening up is very similar to the way archaeal homologues are opening up. And it's also similar to what was seen in opening of ACT2, uh, um, a, a relative um, which is um, a, a neutral amino acid uh, exchanging. So if we look, um, so what we, what we saw on the grids was basically a mixture of the inward facing uh, substrate free state and outward facing substrate bound state. That means that the inward facing substrate bound state is extremely disfavored. So the affinity of that state uh, for the substrate is very, very low. We estimated that it must be more than 10, perhaps even closer to 20 millimolar. It also means that affinity of the outward facing state for the substrate is much greater. And as the protein preferentially is an inward facing substrate free state, the substrate is able to pull it out into the outward facing state. So, so this is basically a peculiar situation where the preferred resting state of the transporter appears to be inward facing and then only in the presence of substrate, it's, uh, uh, it starts populating the state. From these structures, we can also infer what might be the structures of these sister states because the translocation of the domain is usually uh, believed to be mostly a rigid body. So if we have a structure of this state, we can envision what the structure of this state might be. And if we have a structure of this uh, substrate free state, we can envision what the structure of the outward facing substrate substrate free state might be. So if we just compare the transport domain of this guy and this guy, kind of visualizing these uh, events, we can see that we have a, a typical uh, uh, feature where the, sub, uh, where the gating element is open, HP2 is open in a sodium bound state and it would close in a substrate bound state. So in this way, it recapitulates what we've seen in other uh, transporters. We then also determined the structure of the APO transporter without sodium ions, and the structure we got was again of the inward facing state um, uh, like this, and from that structure again we can infer what the outward variant of that might be. So we determined the structure to about three angstroms, and what we saw was um, uh, this characteristic feature as we compare the transport domains of the sodium bound and APO transporter, we saw that in the APO transporter, this methionine, the conserved methionine is swinging out from the substrate binding site out looking into the membrane, which is precisely what we saw in the GLTPH. So even if this methionine is not a magic coupling arm, as we have envisioned it originally, uh, conveying information about sodium binding to the uh, substrate binding site, it is characteristic feature of the structural changes. And we see that the structural changes from APO to sodium bound state are very similar in um, 
in the mammalian transporters, in the human transporters, and the archival transporters, suggesting that the sodium coupling mechanism is conserved uh, from archival transporters to humans. There's one difference, however, when we look at the APO structure between uh, EAT3 and GLTPH. And that difference is that um, in GLTPH, in the APO state, the loop is closed. And that's great because that's, that, that, that's the state in which the transport domain can reorient in an um, extracellular site, completing the cycle. However, in a human transporter, the, the loop remains open. And that's to some extent ex expected because it is expected that potassium will somehow close uh, uh, the transporter, allowing it to come back. And this is the presumed uh, mechanism by which potassium is coupled to the transport cycle. So on a molecular level, what happens is that in GLTPH, it appears that this arginine that descends into the substrate binding site may interact and stabilize the closed conformation of the, um, of the loop. In the human transporters, it interacts with a glutamate residue up here. This glutamate residue has long been suspected to be involved in both proton coupling and potassium coupling. It is replaced by glutamine in archival transporters. And if you make this mutation in human transporters, they lose ability to couple to both protons and potassium, and they actually turned into sodium um, uh, dependent uh, amino acid exchanges. So this residue is clearly involved in both uh, potassium and uh, proton coupling. So what happens to this residue as we load the, uh, the protein with uh, sodium and substrates. We can do that by looking at isolated bits of the transport domain, um, even though we are looking at different states. For the APO and sodium bound, we're looking at the inward facing state. And for the fully bound transporter, we're looking at the outward facing state. Nevertheless, if we focus at what happens in the transport domain alone, we can see that in both of these partially loaded APO and partially loaded state, the residue is partially exposed to the solvent through the open HP2 and um, interacts with the arginine in the APO state, separates from it in the sodium bound state, allowing arginine to assume the position it will hold when the substrate bind, binds. And then it's finally completely occluded in the hydrophobic space uh, once the substrate is bound. So not surprisingly, if you make very simple PKA computations, which are very crude, you'll see that it is a PKA is uh, lower in these states and it's higher in this state, reflecting the fact that it uh, is more likely to be protonated in this fully bound state. So this kind of makes us make a very uh, um, trivial hypothesis that this residue becomes protonated as a substrate bind. However, I feel that this is way premature to say that this is the mechanism of proton coupling because these computations are extremely crude. And there's um, many aspects uh, of that process that in my opinion um, need to be uh, experimentally explored. So one aspect that I haven't touched upon is potassium coupling. And I want to end up uh, this uh, presentation by saying that the mechanism of that coupling, in other words, how potassium closes the substrate uh, uh, binding domain and allows it to translocate remains um, um, unknown. So with this, I would like to uh, finish by um, making a few conclusions. So what we found is that overall elevator transport mechanism and sodium coupling mechanisms are conserved in archival and human transporters. The protons are likely uh, uh, coupled to the transport through the expected residue glutamate 374 that has been long suspected to be involved in this process and deprotonation of this um, residue uh, in the protonated state, it forms a salt bridge with uh, substrate coordinating arginine um, that keep, perhaps keeps the APO transporter open. And this again has been proposed before. And the potassium coupling mechanism has to be somehow tied into this, but remains unclear. With this, I would like to acknowledge the people that done the work, in particular uh, Biao, who done um, most of the work, but also Eva, Darwin, and Jehan the uh, cryo-EM facilities that we use and the funding. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Olga, I for your presentation. Uh, Lars, I, I welcome you now to uh, join the screen share and you can commence. Thank you.
Well, I hope uh, this is all visible to everybody. Yes, we can see you and hear you. Thank you. And then I'll even have a laser pointer. So thank you, Olga, for um, a wonderful talk. Um, and um, I, like yourself, um, I'm presenting this particular work today for the for the very first time. So um, it, it might be a bit of a rough around the, um, the edges. Um, I also have another first. I don't think I've ever given an international seminar yet on my on my own birthday. So uh, it's a nice birthday treat to uh, to be able to share this work uh, with you all. So um, I'm going to speak to you today about um, 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 electrophysiological measurements on a mental transporter. But before I do that, I want to um, give a bit of a, an idea in, in how our lab approaches uh, our science. And that is that we are not really sort of married to a single uh, membrane protein or, or a, a single class of membrane proteins. But actually what we're trying to do is uh, establish, establish new biophysical methods to study charge transport in uh, membrane proteins in general. And I've got three pictures here on my title slide. Uh, and and what, what combines all these methods is that we couple uh, membrane and membrane proteins to solid surfaces in various forms uh, in order to um, uh, allow us to measure the transport through these membranes um, in different ways. Uh, the issue here is that in, in each of these methods, the actual mechanism of measurement is, is uh, quite different. So uh, on the left, we, we measure directly electron transport, and I'll explain this a bit more. In the middle, we, um, we, we induce uh, charge transport with electron transport and measure um, the proton pumping using fluorescent dyes. And on the right hand side, and we use this solid supported membrane technology um, to measure uh, charge transport in a capacitive coupling measurement. Uh, the problem is that in all these three, um, we, we're talking basically about solid supported membranes in the various forms. So when we're talking about SSM-based um, methods, um, it can be a bit confusing in our lab. Um, and, and recently I've started to designate, for instance, the, charge, the capacitive coupling charge, for, uh, tra charge transport as uh, electrophysiology measurements, just to sort of um, contrast it with our electrochemistry measurements. So um, then very briefly, sort of other types of things we do in our lab before I, I um, discuss in particularly uh, the metal transport. So this is an example where we have an, a, a membrane bound hydrogenase uh, in a membrane that is sort of directly coupled to an electrode via um, a detailed uh, system that I won't talk about. But crucially, what happens if this enzyme is uh, active is that it oxidizes hydrogen and uh, the electrons that are released in that way are given to the quinone pool because this is a respiratory um, uh, enzyme. And in this particular system, we can then extract the electrons from the quinone pool using electrochemistry methods. So um, we, here on the right hand side, we then have a, um, a typical plot where we measure the current. And crucially in this particular case, the current is nothing else as the actual electrons being released from the hydrogen where the current is directly related to the activity of the enzyme. And in this particular example, we are interested in, in a state of the enzyme where it is inactive and protected against oxygen damage. And when you then uh, supply the substrate hydrogen, it can take uh, a minute or two before this enzyme is fully activated. And you can see that in this black line here. So at this arrow here, we inject transiently a tiny bit of hydrogen. Um, and it takes a while before this enzyme really generates um, the current and in other words, is fully active. If we then make a mutant of this, uh, this enzyme where we um, dis, um, dis sort of disable this protection mechanism and we do the same measurement, um, we can now inject hydrogen and we see uh, an immediate rise of activity. Uh, and this is then followed by a, a decrease in activity as the hydrogen is being consumed close to the enzyme. So the, in this case, we measure electron transfer uh, in our assay. In a second example, um, we have a liposome or proteoliposomes intact on the surface. So rather than breaking open as in the previous slide where we have a, a flat planar membrane system, we have intact vesicles, which allows us to fill these vesicles with pH fluorescent probes. Um, in this case, um, um, a pyrimidine. And we can still interact electrochemis electrochemically with the quinone pool in these vesicles. Uh, and here we have an example where um, we have actually a, a ubiquinol oxidase or an oxygen reducing enzyme that um, um, takes um, the electrons from the quinone pool 
uh, to reduce oxygen to water. But crucially, if you activate this enzyme, protons are being pumped um, unidirectionally. So either, uh, depending on the orientation of the enzyme, either from the inside or the outside is depicted in this cartoon um, or the other way around. And what we can then do, as you can see here on the right-hand side in an ensemble experiment here on the top, um, at this uh, point here, about um, uh, 75 seconds, we um, apply a potential to the electrode that starts to pump electrons into the quinone pool and activates the enzyme. And you can see a, a rapid rise uh, in the internal uh, pH in the lumen of these vesicles on the surface. And then when we switch the, uh, the electrode off again and the enzyme is, uh, stops being turning over, we can see the protons uh, slowly leaking back in. Um, we, more recently, we have uh, ex extended this method to the single enzyme uh, level, where we now look at individual vesicles um, at a very uh, um, sort of uh, high lipids to protein ratio. So there's very few enzymes in there and only a few uh, vesicles have one enzyme in there. And then we can do the same technique, looking at how these enzymes work on the single, uh, <clears throat> single uh, enzyme level. So you can see that um, as our lab has been working with these uh, membrane modified electrodes, as we also like to call them, um, for about 20 years now, um, we were very interested uh, in this system where um, you use capacitive coupling to look at charge transport. So um, I'll, I'll first, um, let me see whether I can, uh, I can start this. Of course, now I cannot start. There we go. So in this case, we're not looking at electron transport directly from a, an enzyme to a, an electrode. But in this case, what happens is we, if we activate um, um, transport of a vesicle absorbed on an electrode, uh, charged components are being pumped in or out of the liposome. Uh, and in this particular cartoon is an example of being cations being transported in the liposome. And as a direct consequence of that, these positive charges that, that, that are being uh, stored close to the electrodes um, are then compensated in a capacitive manner by uh, electrons moving to the electrode. Uh, and in this particular uh, example, you can see that um, as we have the, the membrane potential uh, being built up close to the electrode, we have a transient current uh, being generated and we get a, a peak-like um, system over here. So um, we have used this uh, system for uh, various um, respiratory enzymes because we, our lab mostly focuses on respiration. And I've got uh, two examples here. In the first one, which is a, a collaborative um, project with uh, Professor Adrian uh, Goldman, we looked at the pyrophosphatase. So this is a respiratory enzyme that uses the energy of the hydrolysis of pyrophosphate to phosphate to pump protons or there's other, enzy uh, other enzymes that, that pump sodium, but this in case it's a proton transporter, a proton pump across the membrane. And we've used this system um, to, to characterize uh, the proton charge transport. So in this case, um, at time one seconds, pyrophosphate is being uh, introduced into the system. And depending on the concentration, we can see um, a positive signal here as protons are being pumped into the liposomes. And if we uh, have the control substrate here, which is just phosphate rather than pyrophosphate, we have no signal. Um, this is published, um, but the interesting um, so observation we made with this one is that this, this particular enzyme has multiple different types of inhibitors. But one of the inhibitors actually still gave a very small current that was well above the background current of phosphate, from which we could induce that um, one of the inhibitors would actually bind, but still introduce a conformational change into the uh, enzyme that was uh, similar to the, the transport, let's say, of one proton. So it, it sort of, this particular inhibitor did one stroke of the, uh, of the transporter and then uh, further blocked any, any further transport. While the other inhibitors um, showed no such effect and, and just inhibited the enzyme via competitive inhibition. More recently, we started looking at uh, bovine complex one, um, which in our mitochondria oxidizes NADH. And this particular enzyme is interesting because it has a, a protection mechanism uh, against the formation of radical oxygen species. 
If there's no NADH uh, um, around in the mitochondria due to um, 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 particular conditions, this enzyme switches off. And on the, uh, on the system, this is easily measured because you can incubate uh, the sensor uh, and the system simply at 37 degrees without substrate for half an hour. And then um, you can do uh, a measurement. And then th this is this black curve uh, by introducing NADH and you, and you measure hardly any current. If you then incubate that same sensor um, for a couple of minutes with NADH, uh, it slowly uh, reactivates. And then the same sensor, now you can see um, as is depicted here in the, in the red trace, becomes active upon the addition of NADH, indicating that it now actively uh, pumps protons into the liposomes. So this is a very versatile uh, method that um, expanded our uh, repertoire of, of different ways with which you could measure respiratory proton transport. But then actually um, we worked together with Peter Henderson and, and Steve Bolton for a while and they had a, a, an active uh, pipeline of uh, crystallography going on for a variety of membrane proteins. Uh, and one of the class of membrane proteins they looked at were metal transporters. Um, and, and via them, we got uh, interested in these metal transporters. Uh, and ultimately, we, we had some interesting measurements of this uh, uh, manganese transporters. Uh, interesting loved it. Interestingly enough, this metal transporter in the end was never crystallized. So we still don't have a crystal structure, but we do now have some um, activity profiles of it. So um, I'm going to, um, the main body of my talk is this, um, uh, the activity of this protein called uh, MNTH2, which is a manganese transporter um, of Enterococcus faecalis. So manganese transport, as is any metal transport, is absolutely vital for all organisms. But it's particularly vital for many pathogens during infection, as the manganese uh, 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 is involved in all kinds of uh, metabolic processes that protects um, the pathogens from radical oxygen species attacks from the host. And then interestingly, the host itself uses the, um, the, the depletion of uh, metals like manganese as a strategy to stop uh, microorganisms um, for, from infecting. So as your, um, whether it's Enterococcus fagalis or any uh, other pathogens are being uh, phagocytized, um, the host, um, be it human or, or, or other eukaryotic species, actually have very similar type proteins in, in their, um, uh, in their endosomes that actively pumps out metals um, from the uh, endosome, thereby starving, if you like, the pathogens from any metals. So um, using uh, enzymes that have similar transport mechanisms, the, the microorganisms and, and the host are fighting for those uh, micronutrients. Enterococcus faecalis itself um, has three manganese transporters, just to indicate how important manganese is for this bacterium. One of them is an ABC transporter, which we won't talk about, but the, the other two um, are, are um, related in, um, in, in, in primary sequence and in structure and are called MNTH uh, and MNTH8-2. And based on homology uh, with uh, other proteins for which we do have a structure, uh, it's believed that this is a, a proton symporter with an alternate, alternative access uptake mechanism similar to uh, uh, the well-known LUT uh, transport mechanism. And if you go into literature, if you look at how these enzymes are, are normally, these transporters are normally uh, studied, it's almost always uh, fluorescent uptake, uh, fluorescent assays. And that is because for these types of metals, there's very rarely a radioactive substrate um, available, which really limits the amount of methods you can use to study them. And this is taken from a really, really nice paper of Bosley et al in, in eLife, but there are many other examples that I could have given where you show. So, uh, in this middle transport um, example over here, they used a uh, FURA2, which is a metal binding uh, fluorescent dye that upon binding of the metal uh, quenches its fluorescence. Uh, so you can follow how much of the metal has been transported in. And they've compared it here with all kinds of uh, uh, mutants of the protein that do not transport metals uh, and they can get a clear uptake signal. What I would like you to note here is that this uh, assays are done on a minute time scale. So relatively slow uptake mechanisms are assumed here. 
Um, they've also been able to then show that this is a, a proton coupled system under these conditions by using a pH fluorescent dye on the inside rather than furor 2. So uh, this, this fluorescent dye changes as protons are being transported. And in the black trace here, you can see that um, the, the pH on the inside changes um, as metals are being um, added to the outside. And in the, the dotted line here, you see the control. So you can clearly see that more protons are being taken up. Now, there are some problems with, uh, with these systems that I'll come back to later. So we purified uh, the MNTH2, and this is a histac uh, protein. I'll come back to that later. And we got it to, uh, to nice purity from a uh, E. coli bacterial system. We reconstituted these in proteoliposomes at a certain lipid to protein ratio. Uh, and we've repeated these types of experiments. And what you can see here is that it does work, um, in this case, with a, a calcine a fluorescent dye in the liposomes. But the signals are not great. So the quenching is only a, a small amount. And that's because calcium is not actually uh, quenched very well by uh, manganese. So the, the absolute amplitudes are, are very small. And then if you do this over various batches, you can see a very large um, sort of standard deviation for each point um, because each batch has a, a slightly different amount of protein uh, and a slightly different amount of uh, calcium um, being incorporated into the liposomes. We got slightly better results if we use uh, nickel uh, as, a, um, as a substrate because uh, nickel quenches the, the calcium dye uh, a lot better. So we just get uh, larger signals. Um, so um, we still see uh, an uptake mechanism uh, with some standard deviation. And in both cases, we get an approximate apparent KM for this transporter in the order of uh, tens of micromole. Um, but there is a, a problem with these types of systems. So first of all, by introducing a fluorescent dye on the inside of these liposomes, you actually introduce an additional driving force because these these dyes have an affinity for your metals, and therefore that affinity actually helps to provide a driving force for the metal uptake thermodynamically. Uh, another problem that could be mentioned is that each of these dyes um, has different um, affinities and a different quench states uh, for the different metals. So if you want to do metal comparisons, uh, some of these dyes uh, can be limiting, as, as I've already alluded to. Um, so again, I've taken here um, another really nice uh, paper, and I, I could have used other papers, but in this paper, what they really nicely showed with calcium, for instance, is that if you add copper to the outside, this dotted line is the control. These are empty liposomes, so there's no, there's no transporter in these. This is a different metal transporter. This is just for illustration purposes. But you can see that copper, even though it's added to the outside, massively quenches the calcium uh, on the inside of the liposome via unknown mechanisms. Well, for instance, zinc, even at uptake, there's only very, very little um, quenching of the calcium. So this just shows you some of the problems um, with these types of uh, methods. The other um, problem that I want to introduce is that um, these are very small liposomes. So in the order of hundreds of nanometers. And if you do some calculations, um, as I've done here, if you assume, for instance, a liposome of 400 nanometers, you have very small volumes on the inside. And if you then add uh, a very relatively high substrate concentration of 100 micromolar, you can calculate that in order to have equilibrium between the in and the outside, you need to transport less than 2,000 molecules of the metal in this case, um, in order to have a, an equal concentration on the inside as to the outside. So if you, if you have a non-active uptake, so non-concentrative uptake to the inside, um, you really don't need to transport all that much. And this then raises a question about these, all these sort of uptake mechanisms where they measure the uptake in the order of minutes. So this is just very, very small, uh, low uptake rates. So um, using an alternative method like the solid supported uh, membrane and electrophysiology, um, you know, we thought could, could shed some light in on this. So what is happening here? So uh, we purified again the enzyme, we created proteoliposomes, absorbed them on the, um, on the gold sensors, and then introduced at time one second, um, uh, the, the substrate, the different metals. So this is then a full trace, as you can see over here. So uh, at time zero, um, the system starts uh, flowing the solution um, over the system, which gives you this background spike that you're not interested in. At time um, uh, one second, you introduce the metal. And I think, yeah, this is the, uh, an example trace of manganese. You then see uptake of the manganese uh, going back to zero. And then if you take the manganese out again at uh, time uh, two seconds, you can see uh, an opposite signal 
uh, indicating that the manganese flows out again. Now, this is, uh, the, the use of metal transport does create a big problem. Uh, most metals will tightly bound, bind to phospholipids, so the negative phosphate, phosphate group um, in, at the phospholipids um, will, will, um, will bind any metal, uh, um, but particularly uh, divalent metal like manganese, uh, iron, copper, uh, you name it. Uh, you, often cannot do this experiment in a phosphate background buffer as uh, some of the metals uh, will, will uh, precipitate as metal phosphates. So you have to use other buffers, uh, which means you, you have to get rid of background signals. Now I'll make a long story short, but we found that by adding um, two millimolar of uh, magnesium in the background, you could get rid of most of the uh, A-specific background, but there was still uh, a significant background. And that background was usually in the order of uh, uh, 0.2 nanoamps in our system. Uh, and uh, our particular uh, metal transporter had relatively low uh, currents, usually in the order of only 0.4 to 0.8 nanoamp. So we, at each point, we had to be very, very careful that we were actually measuring uptake signals and not background. Um, one of the things we needed to check was the, um, the histac, which also binds metals. Um, and that's why you can purify your proteins with uh, nickel uh, NTA, um, is not uh, creating background signals. So we, we cleaved off the histac um, of our protein, and this is a gel um, of the cleaved construct, um, and then had to repeat the experiment, and we still saw all the signals uh, qualitatively completely unaltered. So um, we, we could be confident that it wasn't the histac. We also added um, things like flinomycin and gramocinin to the system, um, to make sure that uh, um, the, the, the uptake was due to um, charge transport, but could be quenched by, uh, by adding flinomycin that allows uh, potassium in this case to transport across. And then we also did um, different lipid to protein ratios where we already had the first indication that something was going on. So in this particular graph, um, we found that at different lipid to protein ratios, um, the kinetics um, weren't actually uh, that different. Um, so the difference in currents um, was within the, the range of currents we saw anyway in the variations, but more crucially, this decay constant over here was the same for all the different lipid to protein ratios. And that started to suggest that the signal is not due to multiple turnover kinetics. Um, so if you look at the, uh, at the literature on, um, on, on how these systems can be analyzed, um, there seemed to be something else going on. Uh, I will come back to that. And then the second thing um, we saw was that if you then change the amount of substrate um, in, in these systems, we did not see our normal michaelis menten type kinetics. It, the, the activity uptake did not plateau, but kept, kept rising. So these measurements were all done on a single uh, chip, a single measurement. Um, so in this case, so here calcium doesn't uh, is not taken off by the enzyme, so it gives us a background signal uh, the red one is a, a separate sensor where we have no protein that also doesn't show any uptake. Uh, and all the other metals show very, very similar uh, uptake uh, um, traces. So again, um, it, it suggests um, that, that we are not really looking at multiple turnovers, which is uh, possibly expected to be slightly different with different KMs for the different metals. And we, um, and we could see that um, the transporter, as, as suggested by literature, could transport manganese, zinc, cobalt, and, ca and cadmium. Somewhat surprising was that it didn't transport um, uh, iron too. Uh, and, and we already knew from literature, it was very unlikely that this transporter would transport calcium. But interestingly, we found that um, the transport, um, we also could not find transport of copper and nickel, and especially nickel was unexpected because nickel uh, was already shown even in our own fluorescent uptake mechanisms to be transported by MNTH2. Uh, and not only did, was it not transported by MNTH2, it actually uh, uh, competitively inhibited the transport of manganese. So for instance, um, here we have an experiment uh, on the left where we have a chip. Uh, we add the, uh, the 100 micromolar of manganese and we can see an uptake, uh, in this case, a, a low uptake um, uh, current of about 0.4. And then if we, on the same chip, we repeat uh, the experiment um, of manganese, but now in the presence also of nickel, you can see that the uptake is, uh, is massively reduced uh, close to the background signal. 
that we got for this chip. So um, this is very unexpected. So although nickel in our thrust assay is uh, suggested it's taken up, here it actually acts as an inhibitor. Copper, we even found that not only did copper inhibit the uptake, so we, from the black trace, we can see that if we add copper, we go to a, a background signal for in the order of 0.2 nanoamp, that if we then rinse the copper out, the, the uptake is not recovered from manganese. So the green one is after rinsing out the copper. It's only when we then rinse our chip with EDTA, um, we go back to the red trace. So copper binds to the protein and then uh, inhibits it, and it's then very difficult to take off again. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this. So this gets me to the discussion. Uh, and that is that um, in, for this particular enzyme, we could measure very uh, conveniently uptake by uh, the solid supported uh, membrane system. But background is always an issue. And if you have very low uptake uh, signals, um, th this, this needs to be very carefully approached. Uh, unexpectedly, however, is that what we see the metal um, sort of selectivity um, of the two methods, fluorescent uptake assays versus the, um, uh, the electrophysiological methods, is different. And this raises some questions that um, we can discuss if there is time. Uh, and I've, um, so I've got a, a couple of, of ideas here. It could be, for instance, that nickel is being taken up, but that the uptake is much, much smaller, that we cannot see it on the second time scale, but we can see it on a minute's time scale. But then you have questions, okay, well, what is physiologically relevant and what do we measure? And then we have this, uh, these issues that um, we have very low currents, lower than we would expect. Um, and, um, and we didn't see any um, influence of the, 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 the protein to lipid ratio, of the lipid to protein ratio. So um, the, there are some ideas here that maybe what we see um, in, in our system, in the, in the solid supported membrane, but this is really speculation over here. Uh, I'll, I'll skip, I'll go straight to here. Um, is that maybe we only see one or two turnovers. Um, so it might be that very quickly we end up in a thermodynamic equilibrium. Um, so what we measure is not continuous turnovers and therefore we don't see any uh, sort of KMs um, of the system. Um, uh, uh, that, that is one uh, possible explanation. Um, the other explanation is that what we actually see is a conformational change after which the system is locked and the release of the metal is much smaller. I wish I had all the answers for you here, but I don't have them at the moment. So um, that just leaves me to thank you for listening. And um, I want to thank particularly uh, Matthias Gantner, who was a PhD student in, in my lab, who did all the work on the MNTH2 uh, MN, MN that I've shown today. And uh, Debiotti and Gordon have continued this work with the, with the complex one that I showed you at the very, very beginning. And I also showed some data that we did together with uh, Adrian Goldman. Um, and as already said, we started, uh, this should have been in red, we started this work with Peter Hannes and Steve Baldwin and Vincent Postis, and I'm grateful for helping us with the, with the protein. I'm sorry, I went, I think I've gone slightly over time, and my apologies for that. Firstly, uh, thanks to both Lars and to Olga for the presentation. And Lars, I think we all want to welcome and wish you a, a happy birthday. So actually, you privileged us with your presentation. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'll now go ahead and moderate into the Q&A. So I'll just kind of go back and forth. And again, I leave it up to the audience if you want to also uh, kind of quasi raise your hand and ask the question yourself. I welcome that as well. Um, initial question for you, Olga. You reconstituted the protein for the SSM measurements. Do you expect a mixed orientation of the protein? And do you think this has an influence on the current properties? It's a super good <clears throat> question because we've been thinking about this. Yes, we expect, I think, a mixed orientation. And I think it's interesting. Something I've been struggling with <clears throat> is that the KMs that we see in the cell membranes and all sites, for example, are lower. So their apparent affinity is higher than what we see in the reconstituted systems. And what we see in on the grids appear to show even lower affinity, at least for the inward facing state. So this kind of discrepancies of affinities made us think a lot about what is it that we actually are seeing in different conditions. And I don't really have a, a good answer, but yes, I think if we had mixed orientation, then we would see contributions from both what we believe is a high affinity and low affinity 
binding, but I'm a little bit confused about this myself. I think it's a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. And then as, as a follow-up question for you, Olga, um, again, compliments to you, beautiful work. As always, uh, curious if you have been able to obtain SSM currents with potassium. Um, you mean reverse currents? We actually haven't tried. Mm -hmm. So the idea would be to preload everything with sodium aspartate and then look at the efflux with potassium. We didn't, uh, we did not do that. Mm -hmm. And then a question for Lars. So again, happy birthday. Uh, did you try using different lipids to see if the background can be improved that way? Meaning do different lipids interact more or less with the metals? Um, no, actually that's a very good suggestion. Um, we, we've been struggling with this protein for a while due to the low currents. Um, and that's probably one of the things we, we could have tried. We used, uh, I think for most, I would have to check. I think for most of the work I presented today, we used uh, um, total E. coli polylipid extract to create a, you know, that, that mixture of lipids that is, is relevant for, for bacteria. Uh, obviously the E. coli lipid extract is not the same as the uh, enterococcus lipid extract, um, but it, it's a very good question, but it is something we haven't done. And then another question for you, Lars, why are the peak currents not go linear with lipid to protein ratio? Do you have a way of determining the effective LPR after reconstitution? It looks like you got constant LPRs for all reconstitutions. Yes, yes. So um, we haven't in, independently determined whether the phosphate, sort of the phospholipid concentration is correct. So there we just assumed that we, we we covered most of the phospholipids, but we used normal protein assays to make sure that our lipid to protein ratios were, were in the order of what we, what we would expect, depending on what we put into the reconstitution protocol. So we're fairly sure that those uh, lipid to protein ratios are, uh, are you know, um, if not to, to many significant ditches, but are, are roughly correct. So why do we then not see the different uh, activities? And that's exactly what I, um, I indicated maybe on the slide, but didn't um, explain enough. So um, that already suggests that what we see is not a total activity um, of the enzyme. So as, as you would expect with multiple turnovers, where you would explain, expect, especially with the decay rate to be different between the different um, LPRs. So um, um, what is one hypothesis, and I'm just saying this is really speculation, is that what we may be seeing with this protein, and that also is suggested by the low currents, is maybe one what well, sort of one turnover after which the system is in some kind of thermodynamic equilibrium um, or otherwise locked um, uh, so the the amount of protein uh, might not be sort of limited but it might be limited by something else not by the number of proteins in the liposomes I, I hope that that answers the question but i have to say that we are we are still not we haven't been able to prove these these types of ideas we just know that something is not exactly as we would like it to be and then uh, now, Ogle, a question for you. Have you had a closer look at the chloride conductance? Do the observations in the SSM experiments fit to the expected properties? No, we have not. Um, I am very excited to look at that, to be honest with you. I think it could be a really powerful technique for us to look at the conductance properties of isolated protein, which is not uh, not that trivial. So I'm, I'm motivated to look at that, but we haven't yet. Mm -hmm. And then as another question for you, Olga, um, can you go over the part where you switch from sodium chloride to sodium phosphate? So maybe elaborating more on this. Mm. So without the sharing slides, what we saw is that in sodium chloride, the, the currents were decaying very fast. So they were very narrow and they decayed fast and they had a negative overshoot, right? Um, so they didn't look like uh, a multiple turnover transport currents. Um, we are quite new to this technique. So it wasn't obvious to us until that was pointed out to us by um, the reviewers. Um, however, when we switched to phosphate buffer and phosphate is not Permian, I, an ion, we now saw a pretty uh, normal looking uh, transport currents. So that made us speculate, and we, well, we think so now, that the uh, narrow currents that we saw were due to the fact that as um, the transporter was transporting, that there was a, a compensating anion current that basically decayed um, 
uh, the cap capacitive currents faster than they normally would. Mm -hmm. That's our take on it. I don't know if that's good enough. And and then Lars, uh, I guess as a, as a nice follow-up uh, question for you on that topic, you mentioned that buffers are important to lower artifacts. What buffers do you recommend? Uh, okay, so the, the the metal has a problem because I, I would actually recommend phosphate um, in general. The um, the problem is with, with some metals you cannot use phosphates because metal phosphates um, will will crash out. Um, so you know it doesn't it doesn't solubilize very well. So in, in that case, um, you, you're bound to use your, your sort of your other um, buffers that are really well known, like HEPIS uh, and 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 MOPS buffer, for instance. Again, uh, I would, I would, uh, and this is true for basically any experiment. I would be always careful with tris being an amine. Again, tris and metals are not a good combination because the amines start to coordinate to your metals. Um, so always be careful with uh, with tris um, unless you you know what you um, you know really what, what you what you're doing, um, so to say. Um, so the, the the transition metals come with a, a couple of additional rules. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, Olga and Lars uh, for the presentation today. Uh, for everyone in attendance, we will make a, a copy available uh, in the coming days as well as a transcription of the Q&A session. Um, we also welcome you if there's any questions after the fact, if you watch the webinar again and have any other questions, uh, feel free to direct that uh, to, to the presenters uh, today. Um, i leave the floor open if anyone else has any last questions uh, before we close out today's session. If not, then we wish you a good rest of your day, wherever that may be. And uh, once again, happy birthday, Lars. <laughs> thank you. And can I, can I thank the thank Nanyan you. team for organizing this, this series? Thank you very much. And uh, can I actually ask Lars a last minute question? Yes. Uh, I, I had a question about the, I guess, respiratory complex. So early part, part of the talk, when you said it could be activated and deactivated state. And could you elaborate a little bit more, like what, what triggers the transition in deactivated or mm -hmm. activated state? Okay, so in, in the complex one, this is exactly what we would, would like to know. Uh, crystals, uh, not crystal structures, sorry. Cryo-M structures are now available, not by us, but by our collaborator, um, who I should have mentioned, uh, Judy Hurst in Cambridge. Um, uh, so um, what, what really governs that transition is, is currently um, under investigation. So, uh, but if you don't, incubated with the substrate and the H for, for a long time at 37 degrees, it just shuts down. So um, electron transfer doesn't happen anymore. So that also means that the reverse electron transfer doesn't happen. And that's quite important because if you if, if the electrons normally go from N and H to the quinone pool, but in reverse electron transfer, you might um, go from the quinone pool to oxygen, creating radical oxygen species. So it's, um, it's not at the NADH converting site, it's um, there's something around the quinone binding site that switches off. And there's, there are some, um, some structures available that shows how this might occur. Uh, and they have so, been published. So if you take the, the enzyme and you add NADH to it, for a while it's not gonna be active and then it will gradually activate, right? Yeah, and, and interestingly, if you do a normal assay in, in a cuvette, you can do that. And you can just see that after a bit of a lag phase, your NADH concentration goes down. So you can see the whole thing. It's sort of the lag phase mm -hmm. and then the activity. But of course, the, 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 the solid supported membrane has this one second time frame that we look at, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a completely different time frame than most enzyme assays. And, and that, that just um, it means you have to do things differently. In other words, you do one measurement after adding NADH and then you, do, you incubate with NADH and then you, you repeat the system where you first briefly get NADH out and then you reintroduce it. And then it also takes some time for, for the system to deactivate. If that would have gone too quickly, of course, then you would be in real trouble. So you, you're really playing with the kinetics of the deactivation and activation and the actual sort of normal turnover. The, um, with the uh, hydrogenase, there's also this deactive state, um, which um, has nothing to do with the quinone site. There is a very complicated system to do with one particular iron sulfur cluster. Um, which um, actually has, has, has kept the community busy for, what, 20 years of, of, of really loads of fun experiments trying to see uh, how that happens. And um, it, it's going to be difficult to explain exactly how, how that happens, but um, 
it, it, it's called a super oxidized state. If there's no hydrogen available, one of the um, iron sulfur clusters goes into a, a super oxidized state after which it's sort of um, the electron transfer through that site is then very, very slow. In other words, it doesn't transport electrons anymore on the normal time scale. And the only way to reactivate it is to, to slowly re reduce that into the normal reduced and oxidized state. So nature seems to have different sort of ways of deactivating enzymes when it needs to. Um, it's not a one size fits all type solution of, of evolution. Um, and, and this is really why I do this work. You know, this is, the, 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 I haven't really spoken about that, but this is really the interesting questions here. So thank you for asking that. Thank you. I think that was a great way to, to end the, the session. So once again, thank you, Olga. Thank you, Lars. Thank you for everyone in attendance. And we look forward to the next session, which will be later on in September. And stay tuned for updates on that.